Um, let's get started uh, for our remote presenters. Uh, I'm Andrew Howard, co-chair of the Asia Pacific Research Platform. Uh, I'm also associate director of uh, cloud services at the National Computational Infrastructure in Canberra. Um, I'll be starting off with a very brief introduction uh, to some of the projects that we're running uh, at the National Computational Infrastructure and our participation in APRP. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the traditional peoples uh, on, on whose lands we meet uh, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with a very brief advertisement for Supercomputing Asia 2024, which NCO will be hosting uh, in Singapore, um, sorry, in uh, Australia in February next year. Uh, we'll have dozens of exhibitors, around 1,200 participants. Uh, we'll be holding, holding it at the Sydney Convention Centre, uh, and we invite you to hop on down to Supercomputing Asia 2024. Our world is joined by a large number of network services operated by our research and education communities. Uh, this map shows just some of the fibres that and network paths that connect us together. Uh, and for those of you who uh, joined the work, the routing working group yesterday, um, there's a lot of work in terms of working to optimise the best paths across these networks. Uh, NCI is one of Australia's tier one high performance computing centres. Uh, we directly support around 8,000 Australian researchers uh, and researchers from around the Asia Pacific region uh, and around the world. Uh, we are Australia's fastest supercomputer, uh, coming in at about 9.26 petaflops. NCI is funded by a, a variety of schemes, including this, the Australian Federal Government, uh, our National Science and Research Agencies, the Bureau of Meteorology and Geoscience Australia. We support the entire spectrum of science, fundamental, strategic, applied and industrial. Uh, for every dollar that the Australian government uh, contributes to NCI, we return $2.22 of national value. So we almost double the contribution in terms of return on investment for our government. Uh, Australia has two tier one high performance computing centres, uh, NCI in Canberra, Australia on the east coast, and on our west coast, our sister centre, the Pawsey Supercomputer Centre. Both centres provide supercomputing, HPC, cloud, data and analytics, and community outreach and training. Uh, our high-performance supercomputer, Gardi, has around 155,000 cores, 756 terabytes of memory, and 640 GPUs of various ages ranging from A100 upwards. We're also experimenting on next-generation GPU technologies from uh, a variety of vendors. Uh, my area runs the uh, Niran Cloud. Niran is from one of the Australian Aboriginal words for the edge. Uh, we repurposed our former high performance computing system to be a massive uh, research cloud, uh, which we're able to offer to the Australian and Asia Pacific research communities. Uh, we have around, this occupies around 22 racks. Uh, it is an open stack based system. Uh, we've got around 42,000 uh, Sandy Bridge processors around 1,440, uh, so 1,440 uh, broadwall processors. Uh, we're about to supplement this with around five to six racks of Skylake processors, which are being retired out of our Gardi supercomputer. Uh, our sister supercomputer center in Pawsey also has their cloud called Nimbus. Uh, just to show you where each of the centers is located and the network connections that support our operations. Uh, we run an environment called Australian Research Environments, or ARE, which is based on a product called Open On Demand. Uh, this provides a friction-free way of anybody to use our supercomputing facilities from a simple web-based interface uh, and contains pre-packaged application services, which are discipline-specific. So we package our bio, for our bioinformaticians all of the bioinformatics uh, tools into containers which can be run on either our cloud or our high performance system, Gardi. We operate and we're involved in a number of national projects. Uh, we support the Galaxy Australia Hub, uh, the National Centre for Indigenous Genomics, 
uh, our Australian research environments, uh, and ARCOS, which is the Australian Container Reference or, uh, Organization. Uh, in 2023, we've got a number of really interesting projects going on. Uh, we'll be adding additional resources to our cloud uh, with three racks of Skylakes. Uh, Kubernetes is uh, something which has been uh, highly demanded, which we've been working on for several months. And we're also, we'll be announcing our Soft Iron Center of Excellence uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we've seen an increasing demand for Kubernetes. We've been doing proof of concept on Kubernetes variants. Uh, we've stood up K3S uh, in tenancy for Kubernetes environments. Uh, and we're currently experimenting with both Rancher and more recently Harvester. Uh, our collaboration with Softiron uh, provides a uh, sovereign supply chain uh, for us, which allows us to run high security, well, high, um, yeah, high security applications. Uh, with data privacy requirements, uh, particularly in the biomedical space. Uh, SoftIron is a uh, modular system, uh, so you can just dynamically add nodes into their cluster. Uh, NCI uh, is heavily involved in data capture and data storage. Uh, we combine our cloud high-performance computing and storage uh, into a uh, triangle where all of the elements are accessible from each of the other elements. Uh, we also have another a number of other projects, our National Cryo-Electron Microscopy Virtual Laboratory Facility, uh, our Australian Research Environments, building more additional discipline-specific areas with tools optimised for each uh, discipline and optimised for running on all of our platforms. Uh, and we provide a common container environment which can run across our HPC and cloud environment. So users can start on the cloud and as their computational needs grow, move to HPC capabilities. Uh, one of the most exciting projects we have running this year is Prospect, uh, which is revolutionizing cancer treatment with precision medicine. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, sequencing 20,000 people in 2023-24, with an expansion to 40,000 sequences in 2024-25. Uh, the idea is to match patients with new drugs, treatment, personalized medicine, uh, some of the challenges are that our health departments are state-based, uh, which has differences in legislative frameworks. Uh, we need to provide a secure data transfer facility from 19 state-based uh, pathology services, providing privacy and data security, uh, managing a consent framework, both pre- and post-mortem, uh, and uh, maintaining a very large data storage volume. And our risks are uh, data leakage or exposure and the exposure of personal private information. Uh, Prospect is a closed research environment. Uh, we keep the data locked in. The researchers bring their workflows to us. We run them and we return the results. Uh, we also have, hold a number of reference data collections across pretty much every field of science. Um, as one of our previous speakers mentioned, uh, data is absolutely key for AI, um, providing fair uh, care and other principles, uh, but most importantly, high-speed access to that data so that people are not wasting uh, valuable compute resources. Uh, that's a very brief overview of NCI. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with me, uh, please reach out. Uh, I'm on uh, Hoover. Uh, or you can uh, join us at any time in the APRP working group. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our next speaker, who is Kiwa Kim from KISTI. Kiwa, could you share your screen, please? Kiwa, can you hear me? Uh, 
Uh, while we wait, does anyone have any questions so far on uh, any of the presentations that you've seen today? There we go, QWorks Online, over to you. Uh, ready to proceed. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you hear my voice? Yep, and we can see your slides as well. Thank you. Yeah. You can see my slide. Yes. Yes. Uh, I start my presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Giuk Kim, working at QT. I'm glad. I'm very glad to present my work here today. My research scope is 60 gigahertz wireless data transmission infrastructure since last year, and I give a presentation about the research. Mm. Mm. At the APIP working group session at the March this year, I introduced the wireless data transmission project of KIST. This, this page summarizes what I explained at the time. We've been working on scientific data collection using IoT since 2018. And last year, we extended to the study of millimeter wave and sub-terahertz-based sub scientific data transmission. The 60 gigahertz frequency has features with low radio interference and enhanced radio security and its unlicensed frequency band assigned by each country has bandwidth exceeds 8 gigahertz so we can achieve very high throughput with it and additionally the the 60 gigahertz band is the frequency used by YGIG standard so we can easily get commercial radio devices of 60 gigahertz in the device market. And I also said in the last session that a set of 60 gigahertz mid-range radio rings between KIST buildings are under construction. Now the construction is done, so I'm going to show you the construction process and the results. First, we participated in a project to receive funds for the construction. Um, within this project, KISTIS role is to create a test bed for a wireless smart building environment and test, um, and test data safety zone based on SDN network separation. We build wireless network in two objectives. The 60 gigahertz wireless network is used to build wireless links between buildings as a part of the backbone network. Our backbone network connects servers located in different buildings by end-to-end -end controllable SDN network. The 60 gigahertz radio connects the sections between each building rooftops in the, in the air. The, the air between building rooftops is the best environment for using 60 gigahertz equipment because the line of sight is guaranteed in here because people or others do not pass by the air. And we also use Wi-Fi devices for wireless access of test nodes. I think there is no need to explain what is the access network using Wi-Fi. We will test some robots or AGVs as a test node. So using using this wireless access network. This is our construction procedure. First, first, four 60 gigahertz wireless equipment were installed in each building. 
next communication boxes are installed next to the 60 gigahertz equipment in each building. And we did opti optical cabling construction um, co it connects each connection communication box to the backbone network switch. And finally, we installed indoor and outdoor Wi-Fi equipment for wireless access. The total construction period took about two months. Um, and I'll show you each procedure in more detail on the next pages. This is the radio equipment we use to build a 60 gigahertz wireless link. It has an independent radio on each side, so it has four radios. So it is, it is originally a device that can communicate in four directions. However, since we will use only one direction facing each other between the two buildings, so we activated only one radio per equipment. And other, another thing to point out is that it, it's a device with 3.8 gigabps of bi-directional aggregated throughput per radio in specification. This means that 1.9 gigabps in, is the maximum throughput in spec when you send traffic in one direction. I'll show you the end-to-end -end traffic throughput test results at the end of the presentation, and you can see that it's almost close to this max throughput. And we, we installed four of these 60 gigahertz equipment were in each building in order to install it high enough not to be blocked by the wall. So we had to set up the steel pipe stand, as you can see in the picture. And second, we um, desired our communication box. The box contains devices to provide power and network connectivity to, six, to 60 gigahertz equipment and outdoor Wi-Fi equipment. And we designed the network cabling of the boxes and radio equipment in this, this way. And we did opti optical cabling construction. The red and green lines are the sections where new optical cables are installed. So through this cabling, the data plane and control plane for the SDM backbone network were constructed as shown in this, this picture. The wireless links belong to the data plane. And these are pictures of fiber cabling construction. And the Wi-Fi APIs for test terminal access we will be explained in indoors and outdoors. Four indoor Wi-Fi APIs were installed in the office of the QST Cleveland Center. And this is pictures of indoor cable indoor Wi-Fi. And we also also installed outdoor Wi-Fi APIs in this six point. Mm, these are pictures of outdoor Wi-Fi wi construction, and you can see that the antenna is installed at an angle so that it can communicate with test nodes below the wall. And is the result of our construction. And, mm, this is end-to-end -end throughput test results. Two servers are located in different buildings, were connected on SDN controllers, and traffic was flowed. And it passes through 60 gigahertz wireless links between buildings, as you can see. But the wireless equipment are not visible in this controller because they are not SDN controller equipment. So I, I pointed that in this, this picture. And anyway, the test results show 1.63 giga, gigabps on a rainy day and 1.79 on a sunny day. As explained earlier, the maximum throughput according to the specification of the equipment is 1.9 gigabps. And you can see that the speed does not increase 
does not decrease significantly even when it rains. If we aggregate the four wireless rings we built and assume two-way communication, then we could show results of more than 10 gigabps throughput. This is future work. In fact, my role ended in building in building a wireless infrastructure, but I can tell you one plan to test on this infrastructure. It uses AGV or robot to transmit real-time video throughput. The the AGV or robot transmits real-time video through the wireless communication while moving in outdoor spaces. Then, then the remote server analyzes the video and controls the robot remotely. Thank you. <laughs> Is my work done in this year. Thank you very much. A very fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I hear that. I will give you as well. You can forward this. Uh, what, uh, big data super highway. In the near future, it's just a term, uh, wireless big data superhighway. Mm -hmm. And there's so many places is there, the isolation is that we develop the wireless that can be scanned, you can work them, you can deploy the wireless wireless technology. So the 5G and the 6G, the wireless sensor, the IoT sensor, and the all of these areas is important to combine the our research there, to the point of view. You can understand the, the, the Thanks, Rahul. Uh, our next presenter is Noor Asila, uh, who will be telling, uh, talking to us about distributed high-performance computing in Malaysia and uh, delivering the Malaysian country update. Uh, over to you, Asila. Uh, thank you, Howard. Uh, thank you, Andrew. So can you hear my voice and screen my screen? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much, Andrew. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Noor Asila. I'm from University of Putra, Malaysia. And today I'm going to update about the project for the distributed high bandwidth HPC. So I'm going to presenting uh, one of the team from Malaysia. Uh, so I believe everyone has listened to Dr. Jong Hoon Kim and Dr. Asif and Dr. Asif Han regarding this project. So I'll skip the introduction. Um, so basically, this is all the activities uh, we have done, especially during in, in Malaysia. So the project started in April 2022. We have several online meetings, and then we have the we have meeting. Uh, at, uh, I mean, during the IPAN 54, also including with the, in the meetings, and then last year in December, uh, the members come to Malaysia, Dr. Jung Hoon and Kim. We have the MOU ceremony, system setup, and some discussion. So you can see some of the photos. And in February 2023, again, we have discussions during the F-155. And recently, in June 2023, we have the international conference for the high bandwidth distributed HPC. And we are so lucky uh, to have uh, the one master node and three working for this project, which helped us a lot in our limitations of HPC resources. So this is actually the conference that organized, uh, jointly organized by University of Putra and also KISTI and sponsored by the Asia Connect and TN. So uh, it held in 2021 20, uh, to 22, uh, 22nd June, uh, 2023. And this is some of the programs. So we have speakers uh, from KISTI, from the uh, Korea and then of course, from UPM, so from various um, field, the computational uh, chemistries, agricultures, engineering, and interestingly, we managed to organize the hands-on workshop, uh, which um, conducted by Dr. Asif Raza uh, for the, I mean, for the beginners, how to use the platform. So we have many um, 
various background participants uh, from the computation, computational chemistry, bioinformatics, agriculture. So I can say it's a successful workshop and it, it is very interesting. Many people looking forward, many researchers looking forward to use this platform eagerly. And um, secondly, we have the hands-on workshop, uh, How to Manage the Platform, which focus for the network engineer and organized by uh, Mr. Kim. So this is some of the photos uh, during the workshop. So the hands-on is actually conducted by Dr. Asif from remote, remotely. Uh, we also have some visits uh, near the Putrajaya. So I, I believe everyone has heard uh, what Dr. Fiza is, and we, uh, Dr. Fiza is my colleague. So uh, just now she presented about the sequencing and how the limitations of the HPC in UPM, um, uh, I mean, focusing in UPM, uh, but in general in Malaysia. So uh, the limitation is actually um, uh, causes quite a lot of money where, for example, like Dr. Visa, they, she has to pay the industry to do the uh, data analytic. And for, I mean, we want to thank you to, for this project, which reduces our limitations on these HPC resource problems. So this is our previous HPC. So it's quite, um, I mean, it's not quite, but it's quite, uh, it's very old. So we assembled in 2012, 2012, and it's already outdated. And this is like a very example of our common practice where we, most of us will purchase like the HPC, just enough for our project. But this one is quite survived. Many users using it since it has one um, GPU V100. Um, so it's quite a waste of money because everyone buying their own. Um, however, uh, it is very hard for us to convince and to get a centralized HPC for our universities. So we put uh, a lot of effort, for example, uh, proposals for the 12 measure plan and uh, from our university's budget, but it's still in progressing. Uh, we also uh, organize quite many uh, HPC uh, workshop for the awareness, uh, like I mean, starting 2005 until today, but there's a gap in several years between the 2013 and 2019. This is some of the poster in our HPC workshop. We one of the renowned speakers that we managed to invite is Prof. Dr. Dr. DK Panda. Uh, for our uh, HPC workshop in 2021. Um, and we also organized like um, the Python workshop, for example, for the data analytics. And uh, this is some of the uh, talks uh, from our users. I mean, the users for HPC from agriculture is very interesting for, from AI, the bioinformatics from Dr. Fiza, computational chemistry. And then this is for engineering regarding the biomimetics. So all these are uh, the users that really waiting and looking forward. Um, you, uh, I just noticed that uh, is everyone can hear because I just noticed that my uh, is I am unmute. Is is everything okay? Oh no. Yeah, we're hearing you fine. Okay, sorry. I just maybe the poster make me confused. Okay, uh, so um. So this is the examples on the one of the project that using the HPC, I mean, the, our small HPC. And our next plan for this project is we are planning, uh, we are hoping that the platform, as what Kim said, is not really ready yet. But we are hoping that in September, we can do the trial run. We just um, have a visit uh, from the computational chemistry researchers that uh, they wanted to try run their huge amount data set on this uh, platform. So we are planning if we, uh, if possible to have this uh, ready in September. And then if everything fine and stable, and we're going to organize more focus and user workshop based on their disciplines like the engineering, um, agriculture and so on. And probably we will provide more awareness on HPC for the beginners for many researchers in our universities. Okay, so I guess that's all uh, from me for the updates on the uh, projects from Malaysia. So thank you, Andrew, and the rest. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're running a little uh, tight on time. 
Uh, so we don't have time for questions at the moment. Uh, if people do have questions, can you please put them in the Hoover application uh, and we'll be able to answer them. Uh, let's uh, move on to our next presenter, uh, Saranjit Kaur Bogal uh, from the Research Software Alliance, uh, who will be discussing navigating the research software engineering community landscape in Asia. Over to you, Saranjit. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saranjit. Um, I'm based out of India, and uh, today I'm presenting a talk on navigating the research software engineering community landscape in Asia. A bit about myself, uh, I am a community manager for Asia region at the Research Software Alliance. I'm also the lead and co-founder of the Research Software Engineering Asia Association, and this year I got selected as a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute. Uh, this is a bit more about me, which brings me uh, my journey that brings me to open source and open science. I've been part of uh, various open source and open science programs, including Google Season of Talks, uh, Google Summer of Code, um, the NASA Tops Subject Matter Expert, uh, and uh, instructor for Cartman Trees. Uh, here is a brief overview overview of what is and what is not a research software. So research software includes all the source code files, algorithm scripts, uh, computational workflows uh, that are created during the research process or for a research process. Uh, software components like operating system, libraries, dependencies, packages that researchers use to perform their research uh, that, that they have themselves not created is not quali uh, qualified to be called as a research software. It's software in research and not research software. So this is the definition developed by the FAIR for Research Software Working Group uh, in 2021. Um, a brief overview about who creates research software and where is it created. Um, so um, as the name suggests, it's uh, created during and for research by researchers or scientists, sometimes even by citizen scientists, independent researchers in industry labs, academic research uh, labs, by open source project maintainers, volunteers, to name a few. Um, where is research software being used? So it's used to automate different tasks, uh, to create new algorithms or to verify existing theoretical results computationally. Um, here are some good practices uh, to store your research software. So um, whenever possible, try to store your research software on uh, open source uh, repositories like uh, GitHub, GitLab, Zenodo. Uh, so that you can easily share it with other researchers and also have version control of uh, the uh, work that you're doing. Uh, some more good practices like uh, use informative file names, uh, use informative variable names. So instead of using random variable names for while writing your code, use uh, informative variable name, uh, which helps you to, uh, you know, which helps your future version. So you're essentially el helping you in the future to understand the code that you have written. Um, whenever possible, do document your code because like, uh, say you're writing a code today and six months down the line, you might really forget why did you write a certain step in the code. So document your code and use uh, version control systems for, for storing your code. Another important uh, aspect uh, of research software is its reproducibility. So why it is essential? It's because uh, if your research software is reproducible, uh, another researcher can easily verify your research results. Uh, it helps, like this helps in establishing authenticity of your research and also helps in getting more collaboration with the wider scientific community. Uh, it also helps in uh, reducing the time spent uh, in reinventing the wheel. So if someone has already done a particular research and uh, their, uh, their, is, uh, their results are reproducible, you don't have to you know, go on and doing the same thing again. Uh, it is hel also helpful to be able to modify a code or to customize it for your own uh, or for uh, specific settings. Um, uh, another important aspect is uh, licensing of research software. 
so uh, we mostly talk about licensing of code uh, but uh, please also bear in mind that it's also important to license your documentation so for example uh, whatever non code contribution you are making for example this slide it's licensed cc by so there are creative uh, creative common license even for documentation the material that you are preparing um, and uh, it's permissive restricted depending on which license you choose uh, make sure you're documenting your code, documenting your uh, images or research outputs that you produce, graphs and all of that. Uh, now, I've been speaking about research software. So here's a brief definition of who is a research software engineer. Uh, so far, I would say for Asia region, or uh, in fact, across the globe, research software engineer is more of a feeling. Uh, rather than a working title because there are very few people who actually have the work title research software engineer and that's because it, because it's still getting recognized within institutes and organizations so it's a broad term for people who combine programming as well as research skills that have trouble defining the role within role and value within academia so some examples are uh, people uh, researchers academicians who really love to code and really Coding is the main part of the research work. Uh, generalists who bring communities together, um, system administrators, software engineers who work within research domain. So all these people could be call, uh, called as research software engineers. Um, a brief history about the research software engineering movement. This started at the collaborations workshop uh, at Queen's College, Oxford in 2012 where a small group of uh, researchers met and they discussed the lack of uh, career opportunity software developers within the academia. And uh, that is when a new role in research emerged called the Research Software Engineer or the RSC. Uh, in 2021, uh, I proposed a project uh, about uh, bringing the Asian community on the research software, uh, global research software um, platform. So this image uh, is a, a visualization of my uh, idea of bringing Asia on the global map of uh, uh, research software engineering community. Uh, it was uh, built, uh, this association was built through a project uh, in Open Life Science program, Cohort 4, uh, where I uh, mostly devised the uh, infrastructure, the website, um, social media for this association. And then we also continued in the cohort five of the same program. Uh, this program that I'm talking about is called Open Life Science. Uh, it's a program, it's a 16 week uh, mentorship and training program open to all. So if you have a project idea, uh, if you have a work, working prototype, uh, try to submit to this program. And uh, there are high chances that you get selected and they train you like you get a mentor and help you develop your uh, project idea based on open science principles. The mission of RSC Asia is to promote and build the research software engineering community and profession in Asia region, while also fostering global collaborations. Uh, here is a brief overview of the activities that we have been conducting at uh, RSC Asia. Um, So uh, we organized uh, and participated in the Hacktober first event in 2021. That is when we launched our association and we had community members helping us build our website and uh, do open source contributions. We also organized a workshop on how to write alt text for scientific diagrams. So um, uh, alt text is the text that you write behind the image. So if uh, someone, uh, uh, requires extra uh, help with reading, like like uh, images are not that uh, screen reader friendly. So if, uh, if someone is using a screen reader to read your slides or documents and there's an image on it, then, uh, and it does not have an alt text, then there are high chances that it will appear like a uh, error, like just it will say image and it won't describe what is in the image. So make sure whenever you're using images in your scientific uh, documentation, uh, make sure that you're providing your alt text to the image. Uh, we also organized the first on conference in collaboration with RSC Australia in 2021, and we are also planning to organize one more this year. 
Uh, we again participated in the HACTO first for 2022. Uh, some more current activities at Paris Asia, the uh, monthly community calls. The next one happens in on 21st September. And the second online RSC Asia Australia Unconference happens from 13th to 15th September. Um, I'll be sharing the slides, and if you're interested, do register for this unconference. Uh, we are also providing scholarships and micro grants for people who need any support in registering. Uh, I'm also a part time community manager for Research Software Alliance, uh, which, uh, uh, which has the mission of. Uh, supporting research software and those who help to develop and maintain it and to bring different research software communities together. Uh, I'm responsible uh, for community engagement by sharing information uh, of different uh, initiatives within Asia region, while also taking back news from Asia to the global community. In the following uh, Software Sustainability Institute, uh, because they regularly conduct uh, programs, uh, camps that could be helpful for people interested in research software. Uh, these are some of the communities of practice and organizations where you could um, participate as a volunteer or just to uh, see what others are doing. Uh, Open Life Science, the Turing Group, RSC Asia, Society of Research Software Engineering, and again, Software Sustainability Institute. Uh, I have uh, prepared a short task. Uh, so it is about what do you think about research software engineering and what do you think about open science for researchers? So if you're interested, uh, just scan the code and fill in a short Google form. Um, and so a few of the selected submissions get a gift from me. Uh, so yeah, that's the task. And uh, why I am at APAN, uh, my objective was to propose a task force, which uh, after some discussion, uh, I realized that it would be better not to create a working group uh, instead of that, uh, doing it so further within the existing working groups uh, to promote research software engineering community within Asia. And um, I'm open to interested people who would like to contact and uh, help, help support the RSC Asia Association. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Saranji. It's uh, really great to see the next generation of software engineers uh, coming up and particularly leadership coming from uh, ladies in the field. We need more gender balance. Uh, our next speaker is Bimo Chantanjo, uh, who will be describing the role of molecular dynamics in drug discovery, uh, and he's from UPM in Malaysia. Uh, please share your screen. Thank you. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, can you hear my voice? Maybe if you could speak a little louder, please. Sorry, can you can you hear me? Push the volume up, please. Uh, can you can you hear me? We, we can hear you, but you're very faint. Perhaps you could move closer to your right. microphone. Yeah, so you can hear me, right? That's good now. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, so. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Bimo from Malaysia. And today, uh, I'm going to show you what uh, I've been doing uh, for the past 20 years. And, and the reason I'm here is uh, we want to show how dependent we are on HPC. So, so in my group, we are doing uh, drug design. So we are, our group is working at the interface of uh, synthetic chemistry and uh, computational chemistry. So this is the question that I always ask everyone in my group that can we trust our results, especially results from uh, molecular simulation. Uh, because as you remember, when we started doing this kind of work 20 years ago, the question asked by people who are doing experimental work is, yes, you can see the molecules on the computer, you can see all the simulation, but we cannot touch them. We cannot see the molecule, we cannot touch the molecule. So the question is, can we trust molecular simulation? So, so the reason why we use computer for designing drug is because the whole process is long and tedious. Yeah. So this is the uh, typical uh, 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 drug discovery process. Uh, it might take 10 to 15 years and one to two US billion US dollar. And I heard that the cost is increasing now and the failure rate is pretty high for oncology is around 95%. So, so, so that's the reason why uh, uh, we always try to come up with ways to shorten the process and also uh, cut the costs. And using computer is one way to shorten the time and also cut the costs. Whether or not it works, well, that's a different story, but at least we try to make this process uh, 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 you know, uh, shorter with less cost, and 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 uh, during uh, pandemic, we can see that uh, vaccine was sorry. So, so is is the display okay? Yeah, How about now? Fine. Much better, thank you. All right, okay, thank you. So, so, so during pandemic, we, we we can see that vaccine was discovered within two years, even less than two years, and and unfortunately, the same thing did not happen with drug. Until now, we don't really have uh, uh, effective drug for COVID. There is Paxlovid, but the the efficacy is questionable. So, so the same story actually did not happen with drug. So this is something that is quite challenging and, and using computer uh, is, we think we can speed up the process to, to, to get the drug. So the reason why we use computer is because we want to replace or complement an experiment because of the cost, because of the time. So we thought, well, if we can use simulation to replace those process, then we might speed up the whole process. Yeah. And this is not something new because we use computer to study the collision of stars or galaxies we use computer to, 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 for, for flight simulation to simulate the explosion, which is quite dangerous. Those who are working in chemistry lab, you, 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 you would understand how, 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 how dangerous it is to, to, to work with, with, with explosive materials. So some of those process we can actually model it using computer or if, if it's too expensive, yeah? If it's too expensive, uh, for example, uh, uh, testing drug on animal, it's expensive uh, right now. We can we can we can we can model it using computer using AI. Yeah? So 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 computer plays a very important role in in drug discovery. And in designing a drug, we use computer to build and display drug molecule to investigate how reactive the molecule is because the molecule needs to interact with the receptor or the molecule might interact with other drugs because in some cases we take more than one drugs. So it's whether or not there are interaction between drugs, we can study using computer. We can calculate the electrostatic potential. We can, we can evaluate the mechanism. We can study the behavior of a molecule, the dynamic behavior of molecule and et cetera. So the whole idea of using computer in designing a drug actually stems from this question. We want to know the location of an atom of the location of electron at certain time. And, and normally we use a Schrodinger equation to, to, 
to, to know where the electron is. And, and from there, we can calculate a lot of uh, uh, molecular properties. And, and this is the equation, and I don't want to scare everybody off, so I'm not going to discuss about this equation. And, and there are two ways of doing it. First is we use a classical approach where we describe a molecule as a large body. So it moves by following Newton's law of motion, F equals to M times A, or we use quantum mechanics when we are dealing with uh, an electron, when we are studying the reactivity of molecule, where we cannot use a classical mechanic. We have to use quantum mechanics to study that. So we are doing both. Yeah. So in designing drug, in, in designing a molecule, we are doing both classical mechanics as well as quantum mechanics with different purposes. Uh, but sometimes, uh, not sometimes, in most cases, uh, the molecule that we are dealing with is big. It's more than one atom, it's more than two atoms. The molecule that I'm currently working on is consists of 100 atoms. So in that case, then this is the challenge. So solving Schrodinger equation for multi-atoms is tough, yeah? So that's why we don't use this equation. So instead we use approximation. This is the approximation that, that we use to simplify the system is called Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So those who watch Oppenheimer, you know this guy, Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So this approximation helped us a lot. Yeah, And this is the basis of molecular dynamic simulation where we use HPC to, to, to carry out the, the, the experiment. So in this approximation, they assume that, not the assume, uh, the approximation says that the mass of proton is much, much, much larger than the mass of electron so that we can ignore the mass of electron. We can ignore the movement of electron. So, so by using this approximation, so we can use a classical mechanic we can use classical mechanics instead of quantum mechanics so that everything can be described using Newton's law of equation. So the equation now is much simpler, much, much simpler. You can see this is equation that we use to calculate the bond strength, to, to calculate the, 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 the angular energy, torsional energy, and also we calculate non-bonded interactions, which consists of Leonard Jones and Coulomb interactions. So, so, so by using von Oppenheimer approximation, then everything is doable using the current uh, uh, computer technology that, that we have at the moment. But in some cases, we mix that. Yeah, we mix QM and MM. So when we study small molecule, less than 100 atoms, we can use quantum mechanics. And if the system is larger than 100 atoms, then we have to use molecular mechanics. So, this is the most popular technique that people use to study the to, to study how uh, a drug molecule interacts with the receptor, how the drug molecule works by doing protein drug docking. So basically, by using computer, we can see how the drug molecule. You can see that molecule at the center interacts with the whole receptor. And uh, this is the equation that we use. This is the equation that put in a computer and computer will do the calculation for us. So basically it calculates the delta G, the Gibbs free energy that represent how strong the interaction between molecule and receptor. And from there, we rank the molecule based on how strong they interact with the receptor. Uh, and the calculations are based on these interactions, uh, hydrogen bond interaction, pi interaction, hydrobaby contacts, one of the strongest interaction and happen in, and, and this interaction happen in all drug molecule. We also consider ligand and protein flexibility, and also we consider the presence of water molecules. And because this technique is so easy and freely available, people publish a lot of papers using this technique. Yeah, and I remember during the pandemic, there are more than 150 papers published using this technique per se. So basically people come up with a lot of suggestion, this molecule, this molecule, this molecule can interact with the virus based on this technique per se. But we have to be very careful because the whole idea of computational chemistry is based on von Oppenheimer approximation where we neglect the presence of electron. So, so this is something that I want to bring this issue to your attention that, that doing docking per se is not sufficient. 
Why people do docking? Because they want fast results, something that can be published quickly. That's one. Second, they don't have HPC. So that's why I'm here to talk to you that APG is, is very important, especially in, in developing and least developing countries. Because they don't have HPC, but the pressure to publish is so huge. So they, so they just do whatever they can to publish something. And this is the solution. Just do, just, just do a quick molecular docking to see the interaction between one molecule and viral molecule, SARS-CoV-2 receptor, and then voila, publish something. But basically it's meaningless. But we see hundreds of papers. I'll see you the list of papers uh, in my presentation. So, so, so this paper is very interesting. So the idea is we have to be aware of the limitation of molecular docking. And one is we ignore water molecules, yeah, because of the uh, uh, if we include water molecules, then the calculation will be quite heavy for the computer that are uh, commonly available in. In, in developing and least developed countries. So, so normally we ignore the water molecules, so the calculation can be done within minutes. Yeah, and we can write manuscript later on. So we ignore the water molecules. This is something that cannot be done actually in actual situation because the interaction between molecule and water has to be calculated. Water contributes uh, uh, importantly in the interaction between molecule and receptor. So we cannot ignore, we cannot just ignore the presence of water molecule. But unfortunately, when we do docking, we have to ignore the water molecule to speed up the process. Second is we ignore the receptor flexibility to save time, to speed up the calculation. Yeah? If we have HPC, we don't have to do this. We can model everything flexible, including the, the drug and the receptor, but because of the limitations, some people, most people, they don't have HPC. They have to do this by, 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 by fixing the, the, the receptor and let the molecule move, which is not correct, actually. Yeah. Because it, it brings some serious implication, which I will show you in, 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 in my presentation. Because if we model the protein as a rigid body, we lose this kind of movement. I, I'm, I'm showing you one example from acetylcholinesterase. So in this enzyme, the protein actually is flexible and the movement of phenylalanine 330, you can see here, phenylalanine 330 actually plays very important role in the catalytic activity of this enzyme. And by doing simple molecular docking, we cannot see this movement. So the result we get from molecular docking is not accurate. And this is our personal experience with molecular docking. So we published a paper in 2012, so a long time ago, more than 10 years ago. So actually this is the result of molecular docking versus our experimental result. So what we get, the result we get from molecular docking, we test it in the lab. So we really test it in the lab because in the lab we do both, experimental and uh, computational. So there is no correlation. There is no correlation between the activity of the molecule and the binding energy based on molecular simulation. Yeah. So we expect there is a correlation, but the actual result, there is no correlation. And the reviewer will ask why. And, and we, we answer well, because when we did molecular simulation, there are a lot of approximation. And this is something that is not very surprising, actually. So there is like there is lack of correlation. So this is something that actually becomes a turning point in my career because before we published the paper, I always believe in molecular simulation. I trust, I trust whatever computer gave me. Whatever computer gave me, I trust. So, so when we saw that result, then we, we, in, in, in our group, we, we, we made a decision, all results from computer simulation has to be tested in the lab experimentally. So we cannot just rely on molecular docking result and conclude this molecule is good as a drug. We cannot do that anymore. Yeah. And this is what I mentioned before. Yeah. During the pandemic, there are more than 150 papers, uh, uh, 168 papers on molecular docking simulation of SARS-CoV-2 and PRO, so the, the Proteus of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And from this uh, uh, analysis, uh, none of these papers did validation. So everything is just molecular docking without any validation, without any validation. So after two or three years of pandemic, there is no single drug 
from molecular simulation because zero validation. So this is something that 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 come to our attention. So 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 now we change our strategy. So this is where HPC becomes very important in our uh, in our work. Uh, now instead of using molecular docking per se, uh, I show you in my previous slide that there is no correlation between docking results and experimental results because we ignore the fact that protein is flexible. Now we decided in our group, we have to do molecular dynamic simulation to simulate the flexibility of protein. And because MD simulation is, 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 is computationally heavy, so we have to use HPC here. Yeah. So this is what we are doing now. So we model the flexibility of protein using MD followed by molecular docking. And this technique is called ensemble docking. And it was introduced in, uh, in, 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 in 2018, before 2018 by Jeremy Smith, uh, one of my PhD examiners, yeah, uh, Jeremy Smith. So they introduced, his group introduced this technique ensemble docking. So basically we have to model the flexibility of protein using molecular dynamic simulation. So this is the, 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 the flow chart. So we, we start with uh, simulate the protein. So we get the, the, the whole uh, uh, a conformation of flexibility of protein and we do uh, molecular docking simulation after the uh, MD. Uh, this is what we did uh, in 2017. So we are preparing a manuscript. So by doing molecular dynamic simulation, we discover something very important that molecular docking was not able to discover this. So we discovered this movement. If you can see this uh, movie, you can see that the blue amino acid is moving up, down, up, down, up, down. You won't see this when you do molecular docking per se. You won't see this. We, we are able to see this because of molecular dynamic simulation. And this changed the whole story of how we design a drug for P84 because when when this histidine six four zero opens, we can design a bigger molecule to fit into the binding pocket of this enzyme. And now we are using the same technique to design drug for uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we are working with uh, uh, people from 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 Japan and also from Malaysia and Indonesia to design drug for tuberculosis, and we are using the same technique, uh, which is ensemble docking. So. So that's why I'm here. Uh, I hope uh, by uh, listening to this talk, uh, we realize that HPC is very important to support a drug design campaign because we want to model the system, the whole system, drug and receptor as accurate as possible. And, and it requires huge computing power. And I hope uh, uh, we, 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 we can collaborate more between we chemists and, 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 com and, and computer scientists and people who, 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 are, who are working on uh, developing the HPC and especially in developing and least developed country. So that's all from me, uh, it's a short presentation and uh, over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. Uh, our final speakers for this afternoon or for this session are Alex Moira and Josu Lee. Uh, Alex is from the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology uh, in Saudi Arabia, and Josu from Kaust in Korea. Over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, hi, good morning. I'll be doing just a brief introduction to our speaker today, uh, Dr. Jay Lee. Um, I'm from Kaos. We are from Kaos, the uh, King Abdullah University of Into a Cray supercomputer. 
uh, which uh, will be soon replaced. And then I will leave that to for Mr. Um, Dr. Jason Lee to, to speak. And uh, he is our facilities director in the Research Computing Core Labs. Um, so with that, up to you, Jizu. Hey, let me share slide. So can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So, uh, so my name is Jisoo Lee. Um, so my, I'm a facility director here and I'm responsible for the HPC, AI, and the visual region services at Coast. So today I just want a very brief introduction of the HPC and AI activities, focusing on the infrastructure and application. So we have a true system uh, to support the need uh, for, for the for the cows and even the kingdom. So our flagship system is a Shaheen two supercomputer. Uh, this has the performance. This has a latent pack performance of 5.5 petaflops. Uh, it is powered by over 200,000 Intel Haswell cores. And this is one of the largest all, uh, CPU, all CPU machine in the world. And that's by design, because we just want a system. It's very easy to use. Uh, and that strategy has paid up that at this point that um, we have about 115 faculty uh, using the machine. Uh, which might, might sound much, but actually the COUS is a very small university. So that's about 60% of faculty. So imagine that your supercomputer is used by 60% of the whole population. That is very unusual, I guess. Um, so we have made, the, this system was introduced in 2015 and we have made the improvement both in software and hardware, uh, but there's no getting around that this system is getting old. So we started the procurement of its successor, uh, that's the Shaheen 3. Uh, so we decided not to worry about the uh, new names, so we just go with the numerals. Uh, so in the designing for the Shaheen 3, we start with a with a workload. So we want to accommodate multiple workloads. For example, that what is run on Shaheen 2 at this moment, moment is traditional HPC workload that we want to accommodate that. And also we have to focus on AI workload too. At 2015, it was not too significant, but at this point, I guess everyone in the world, they, they have to do that. And also, we also feel that, I mean, there was a hybrid workload. What we mean is that even for the single application, they use both traditional HPC side and AI in a single application. So what we decide to do is we decide to go for the single unified system with module architecture. So we have a CPU partition and GPU partition. And also we are trying to provide more ways of the user to access the system uh, other than single batch scheduler. So in terms of the performance requirement that is, uh, we are focusing on real application performance. So the good thing about Kaos is that we know who is using the machine. And we know who will use the machine and we know what they do. And we have pretty good idea what they're going to do uh, in the future. So based on, because of, it's easier to get the requirement, that is just easy to optimize the system for, to, for, the, for, the, for the particular requirement. Uh, so, and of course there's a storage requirement and interconnect. Uh, so we uh, went for the open, open tender and eventually select HPE Cray EX system. Uh, so it has a CPU partition. Uh, this is about 60, uh, 4,600 node, and each one has a two AMD Genoa CPUs. And it has a GPU partition as about 700 node, and each one has a so-called NVIDIA Grace Hopper super chip. Uh, so this is the architecture that tip in, in gen I mean, so far that if you want to use a GPU card, it is sit on on the PCI Express bus, but this is the one that CPU and GPU in the same module. The advantage is that compared to the PCI Express card, that the bandwidth between the CPU and GPU is increased by seven X. So that is a kind of the, this is a newer technology and we are the early adapters 
so there are three institutes in the world that is going to use the, this, uh, this chip in large quantities. So us and the CSCS of Switzerland and the Los Alamos National Lab of the state. Uh, so it is kind of the good partner to be in. We are a bit nervous because we are the kind of the first early adapter. So we are kind of guinea pig, but we feel that that's worth the price. Uh, so in terms of storage, we have about 80 petabytes of storage. Uh, I'm pretty sure it will last a couple of years and then we have to expand. Uh, so the CPU partition actually, the installation of CPU partition is started, actually is ongoing in the basement. And we are expecting to provide production service by the end of this year. And the GPU partition will come in next year. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we'll just provide service there. So, okay, and this, uh, we ha have, have another system called IBEX. Uh, this is kind of the commodity. This is the kind of system my staff uh, built from scratch. So this is kind of, you can think of like DIY cluster, right? Uh, so it has a, uh, about 10% um, of the shine computing power. And it has a heterogeneous architecture, as you can see, it has a CPU node and GPU node and so on. And you might wonder why you, you need IBEX cluster if you have Shaheen, right? So one comparison is that, so basically there are things that it's not either, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's not possible to accommodate within Shaheen or it's not appropriate. So one comparison I can give is that you think like a Shaheen, like a Ferrari, right? So in your house, suppose you have only Ferrari, then if you go to a convenience store, maybe 500 meters away, you don't want to use a Ferrari, you want to use a Hyundai, right? So basically that's why you have to have a kind of, have multiple resource to complement. We feel that's the kind of much easier way uh, of the e easier, even the efficient way of uh, demand, uh, the meet the resources, uh, meet the requirement from the from the kingdom, uh, from the Kaustan kingdom. Um, so in the, in terms of the, when they, when we start the procurement of the Shine 3, it was a kind of good chance for us to review uh, what has been done with the Shahin 2. And over his lifetime, it's provided about 7 billion core hours uh, to about 1,500 users. And you can see that the area is pretty diverse. And what I imagine is that it's not very different from any open research competing facilities. I mean, what actually do at Kaust, you might have that this is very special region, but in reality, it's not very different from the, let's say, Berkeley or Korea. Uh, so I just want to just give a pretty uh, simple overview of the application. So they kind of classify as a few domains that these are kind of areas that is used more heavily. Um, so I'm going to use just, I'm going to give just a couple of examples for that. So first example is that this is a flow, a fluid flow around a racing car. So Kaus has a collaboration with a, with a, uh, with the McLaren racing team, and we have multiple activities there. And one of the activities is the full scale simulation of the racing car flow around the racing car. So the goal is that to do the full vehicle simulation, but in a much higher accuracy than what has been done before. Uh, so the faculty who are leading this project that he want to use higher order model uh, for the for the solving the differential equation. And the collaboration with my team is that then he has to implement on Shaheen too. So we work together to identify the performance bottleneck. And when then we optimize the code and scaling up all the way to the side of the Shaheen 2 cabinets. So that's kind of example that we do for the collaboration. Uh, other example is a seismic. So, so, so this is kind of the, uh, there's an entity in Saudi uh, called Saudi Aramco. That is the biggest company in Saudi and probably one of the biggest company in the world. Uh, so they are doing this kind of reservoir simulation. So they want to simulate the res oil reservoir of the kingdom. So at that time, the operational model is called uh, mega power, so which means that they divide the kingdom into one million cells and do the simulation. 
Of course, they want to enhance the, their accuracy. So ambition at that time, this was done about a few years ago. Ambition at that time is that they want to enhance the accuracy by a million times, right? So that's what the Terra Power that's aiming for. The problem, they have multiple problems that one of the problem they have is that they want to kind of test this new idea, but there's no facility in Aramco they can test it. Uh, so that's how we come in, that we work with them. Uh, they are able to use the whole Shaheen uh, for themselves for a couple of days, but also we help them to optimize the course. So eventually they validate their code. Uh, then they went to the CEO of Aramco, say, okay, I own a bigger machine. Uh, so they got the, their wish. Uh, so they by they they later when they value the code, um, they got the the machine that is uh, just used for the seismic so sorry for the reservoir simulation. So at that time, this this was like one trillion cell simulation is a, is the the biggest simulation ever done in the world. So it was a world record, and with Aramco that we have a three world record, and so it has been very nice collaboration. Uh, between them, between Aramco and us. Uh, so uh, I think that probably I'm just running out of time. So there's a, this is another collaboration with the Saudi electricity company. They are the one who is providing electric power to all these uh, houses and factories and so on. And one thing we did is that we are trying to reduce the, uh, the, the, the power loss. So there's a, something called technical loss and non-technical loss. The technical loss is because of the loss uh, from the production to the distribution because of the infrastructure, uh, the technical limitation. And all other losses classifies as non-technical loss. And so there, of course, the, the, the tech, a non-technical loss, you, I mean, you have to focus on how to reduce the inefficiency. And we work them, with them to identify the, the, the source of the, this non-technical loss. And their, their way of doing things that they have chance of, the, they have success rate of a 3%. We, we work with them to increase that to 30, 75%. So by applying this way, uh, this is based on the machine learning uh, for the anomaly detection, uh, then we can just save that about $20 million every year uh, by applying this method. Uh, so I, I know that I'm kind of the, up to time. So I think I just want to end with the, um, about the building communities. So uh, the, the, the role that uh, the KSL plays, uh, the my um, lab plays is, the, is something between uh, University Computing Center and the National Computing Center. So eventual goal is that we want to be part of the building national HPC and AI ecosystem. Uh, that has a two component. One is the providing infrastructure and the other is providing community. Uh, regarding the providing infrastructure, we are actually serving about tw about 20 organizations in the kingdom. Actually, the, we are the only meaningful provider of the computing cycle, uh, computing services. And we also do consulting and training too. And regarding the community that there's a lot of activities, and one of the notable activities is uh, HPC Saudi. This is annual event. This has been going on more than 10 years, and we are actively participating there and to engage with their communities there. And also, we has to host the event twice. So by doing that, we just want to not only serve the coast, but also the kingdom too. All right. Okay. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jesu and Alex. Uh, this brings us to the end of the Asia Pacific Research Platform uh, sessions in this uh, We would certainly welcome uh, any of you who have uh, interesting projects you would like to share um, or updates from your country uh, or just anything else you think would be applicable to this group. Uh, please let us know and um, we can schedule uh, sessions at the next APAN meeting. Uh, so with my coaching and I, thank you very much for joining us today.